ESPN has started airing its new documentary, The Last Dance, chronicling Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls' final 1997-98 championship season. Just after seeing the first two parts, it's brought back a lot of memories. And in this video, I want to reminisce just a little bit on the one and only time I saw Michael and the Bulls play live. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Anwar Youssef Dunbar and this is Big Discussions 76 Sports. First of all, please like this video, please share it, and please subscribe to my channel. Well, in this video and in my last video regarding uh, the documentary, uh, The Last Dance, uh, I've been wearing a, uh, a black tank top and the reason I'm wearing this is because I don't have any uh, Michael Jordan or Chicago Bulls gear. I have some Clippers gear, which I bought for the sake of um, spiting the Laker fans. Or, um, no, actually I bought that Clippers gear uh, because I planned to shoot a series of videos over the NBA season leading up to the playoffs regarding the Lakers <clears throat> and the Clippers. But I don't have any Bulls gear. And so uh, I thought that this black tank top would be uh, most appropriate as we used to wear these in the 80s and the 90s when we, whenever we would go to the basketball courts outside or at the Y or at community centers to play. But I used to uh, have quite a bit of um, Bulls gear uh, when I was in middle school. I had these, these red sweatpants with Bulls written down the leg and I, I believe I had a t-shirt with a number 23 um, on the front and the back which said Bulls. I didn't have an authentic jersey but I had a t-shirt I think which was made by a starter and I had a um, I didn't I didn't have a, a, a starter jacket uh, I had a, uh, a Swingster off-brand though I did have a red Chicago Bulls baseball cap and I would I enjoyed putting all those things on together so that I so that I was Chicago Bulls from head to toe and I had some black Nikes now, um, oh, I also had a, uh, a t-shirt with uh, a cartoon of Scottie Pippen on the front and a cartoon of Michael on the back. It said, Pippen to pass and Jordan to smash. So Pippen was kind of with the ball like this running and Jordan was dunking on the back of the shirt. Now, my best friend, uh, Gabe, he had uh, the more popular starter jacket, so the solid white. I'm sorry, the solid red starter jacket with the bulls written across the front and the, the, the starter S sewn onto the cuff. He had that. He also had uh, several pairs of uh, Air Jordans. And, uh, you know, I've never ever owned a pair of Jordans. Uh, we just didn't have the money when I was a kid. Uh, I might, now that I'm older and I've started my career, and right now I don't have any expenses as aside from myself uh, you know before I before my time is up on this earth you know I might just go ahead and purchase myself a pair of Jordans one day just to say that I I, uh, I had a pair when I was alive but um so I had a swingster jacket and uh, Gabe had a starter jacket and that was the the late 1980s and it was around that time when uh, Gabe's dad, uh, the late Mr. Uh, Kenneth Bernard Smith, got his tickets to go to the Odd to see the Chicago Bulls play live against uh, the Miami Heat in a preseason exhibition game. So me and Gabe, we were we were diehard Bulls fans, and um, I didn't take an interest in sports until middle school so until the late 1980s and so I, I came into the whole Michael Jordan experience and the whole craze just as they started assembling the roster uh, the core group that comprised their first three-peat 
Uh, and so that's in addition to Michael, that was John Paxson and Craig Hodges and Scotty Pippen and Horace Grant and uh, they had just traded Charles Oakley for uh, Bill Cartwright and you know that was that was the core group uh, that comprised that first three-peat. I think that first year they also had players like Dave Corzine and Sam Vincent and uh, Charles Davis and uh, a bunch of role players. Oh, how about uh, Brad Sellers, baby Brad Sellers, uh, number two. Uh, Brad Sellers was on uh, the team with Michael the 1988-89 season when they met up with uh, the Detroit Pistons in the conference final and um, Jordan stole the ball and then he slung it back to Brad Sellers at center court and Brad Sellers tossed it back to Michael and that's when Michael took that dribble and did that uh, reverse shot where he threw it up behind his head and Bill Lane Beer fouled him. I remember watching that game. That was awesome. But Brad Sellers wasn't on the roster the next year. But but I came in when Michael hit the shot against the Cleveland Cavaliers. And I, I still remember, that was probably seventh grade, and I still remember me and Gabe uh, watching the game uh, at our house on Buffalo's east side on Harriet Street and uh, it was the fifth game and I remember just being on the edge of my seat because the Bulls had to win that series they just they just had to win and uh, you know uh, Craig Elo hit a couple baskets Scotty hit a three-pointer and then Michael hit a pull-up jump shot and then uh, Craig Elo hit, hit a, a layup off of out-of-bounds play and then uh, the Bulls got the last possession, and that's when uh, Michael uh, caught the ball, dribbled to the top of the key, and shot the ball over Craig Elo, and the, and the ball just kind of rattled in. I'm sorry, it rattled in, and me and Gabe jumped up and just went nuts. Um, and that, that shot, the shot, as we call it today, that was one of the best times of my young life. And even now, as an adult, that was one of the best times of my life, seeing Michael do that and just being a part of that as a fan watching um, in Buffalo. Um, so there was nothing like it. That was an, a very innocent, a very innocent time, a very, a very fun time, a, a time of discovery. So, you know, before um, the Bulls, became the Bulls of the 90s. They were a young team and they were battling um, and trying to ascend upwards. And the team that was holding that top spot in the Eastern Conference were the bad boy Detroit Pistons. And when I came in and started watching, the Bulls had already lost to the Pistons the previous year in the semifinals. And then they met that year and the year after in the conference finals. And uh, each year the Bulls made it more and more of a series and each time they lost, as a fan and as a young fan, I was hurt. And it hurt me every time they lost to the Pistons. So I really, really felt those series. And this was before Space Jam. It was before the original Dream Team. Um, it was before, uh, you know, that second 3P. It was before all of that. So at that point, you, you didn't know that they were going to become this dominant team. And you didn't know that Michael was going to become... Uh, this transcendent figure uh, and you, you didn't know that he was going to you know become who he became it was all you know the tongue hanging out uh, you know I want to be like Mike the Spike Lee commercials uh, the Wheaties commercials I you know I really enjoyed the Wheaties back then by the way so you know and so we had pro basketball in Buffalo in the uh, late 1970s and the early 1980s we had a franchise called the Buffalo Braves which eventually got moved out west and reincarnated into the San Diego Clippers and then to now the LA Clippers so um, as I came of age in Buffalo we didn't have professional basketball there and so on the Braves before they left you had players like Bob McAdoo, Bill Lane Beer, Adrian Dantley and uh, Randy Smith. Those are the big names that I remember. So, 
you know, it was, and so this exhibition game, um, I mean, it was a big deal, not just because Michael and the Bulls were coming, but just because we didn't have pro basketball in Buffalo. We had pro football, and we had pro hockey, and we had minor league baseball, but we didn't have professional basketball. And our nearest big-time college basketball team was Syracuse, which was two hours away. We had some smaller Division One schools like Canisius uh, and St. Bonaventure. UB wasn't D1 in, that, in those days, I don't think, but we had Niagara, um, Canisius, and St. Bonaventure. So this was a big deal. Uh, that previous offseason, uh, Doug Collins was uh, fired by the Bulls, and Doug had led them to the conference final against the Detroit Pistons. Um, replacing him was an unknown coach named Phil Jackson, who um, was on the bench with them the previous year, and who I remembered seeing in my uncle's old uh, Clyde Frazier book, Rockin' Steady. So Phil Jackson was uh, a part of those 1970s New York Knicks teams. And back then he had this bushy mustache and this long curly hair. And now uh, somehow he was the head coach of uh, Michael Jordan's young Chicago Bulls. I remember uh, in Sports Illustrated uh, leading up to that season, they took a picture of Phil Jackson uh, with the three rookies on the team, Stacy King, uh, B.J. Armstrong and another kid named uh, Jeff Sanders, who um, I was unfamiliar with, actually, because I wasn't watching college basketball. I was unfamiliar with all three of the guys. But I remember that picture. Phil Jackson was standing, and he was wearing, wearing a, a, I think, a short sleeve shirt and black sweatpants and the black Jordans, the black Spike Lee Jordans, and he was bent over, you know, smiling, and the three rookies were sitting down in front of him. And that's who that's who the Bulls were going into that year. So you, you're adding those three rookies on with Michael and Scotty and Horace Grant and John Paxson and uh, Craig Hodges and you know that that core of players. And there was also a player on that team uh, named uh, Ed Neely. And I don't know if Ed Neely was on the initial group, but I know that he played some significant minutes for them in the playoffs against uh, Charles Barkley and the Sixers that year. Uh, I remember Phil Jackson, He his thing was he wanted to play Michael out on the wing because Doug Collins, uh, down the stretch of the previous year when they got to the conference finals against the Bad Boy Pistons, Doug uh, Collins played Michael at the point guard position to get him involved in everything and to put as much pressure on the defenses as he could. And it worked up until they ran up against Detroit. Uh, but Phil Jackson said, no, I want to put Michael back out on the wing where I think he'll be most effective, and um, that's that's what we're going to do, and that's what Phil Jackson did. So um, going into, so Mr. Smith, uh, Mr. Smith um, uh, was a, a great man. He wore these top hats and uh, usually these short sleeve shirts and slacks and shoes, and he had a beard. Uh, just like mine, maybe a little thicker, and he drove this teal Cadillac. And so I remember uh, Gabe and his father coming to get me, and we went down to the Odd. And for those of you who don't know the Odd, that's that was our major sports venue during those years where the the Sabers played and where we had concerts and other sporting events and uh, WWF wrestling. And we went down there, and the Odd was buzzing, and there were people and there were kids everywhere. And I remember walking into the arena. And just wanting to see Michael, there were rumors leading up to that game that he wasn't going to play. But at the last minute, uh, he said, "No, I'm not going to disappoint the fans, and I am going to play." And uh, he did. And when I and when we walked in that evening, the Bulls were down on the floor warming up, uh, and the, the Heat were, were warming up. And um, you know, whenever you took your eyes off of what was going, all of a sudden you heard this, "Ooh!" and this. Ah, you know, and every time Michael dunked the ball in warm-ups, you know, the fans and the crowd went nuts. And every time Scotty dunked the ball, you know, the fan and the crowd went nuts. And Horace, I think Horace got the same reaction because we just didn't have pro basketball in Buffalo in that era. And so 
you know, that was the core group of their first three P, and they were still young, and they were still uh, a year away from ascending to the mountaintop. That Heat team they were playing, you, you also have to remember that the Heat, I think that was their second year of um, uh, being an, an expansion team. They were an expansion team along with the Minnesota Timberwolves. And I think it was the Timberwolves. I think Orlando and... Um, no, 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 no. Miami and Charlotte were the first round, and then Orlando and, and Minnesota were the second round. So, anyway, in any case, uh, Miami was in their, I think, their second year of being an expansion team, and on that team you had young players like Ronnie Cycli and uh, uh, Pearl Washington from New York City. Both played at Syracuse. You had uh, Grant Long and John Sunvold and, uh, you know, other players like that. So they weren't a very competitive team. So, and, and that's how the, the game played out. And, uh, oh, they were, they were coached by um, Ron Rothstein, I believe. But, um, and that might have been their first year, the first or their second year. In any case, that's how the game played out. You had the Bulls, who were the more experienced team, the more talented team. And, uh, you know, Michael and, and the starters, they played in the first half. And then, uh, unfortunately, they sat in the second half, but that made sense because uh, while they were there to entertain us, they had a whole 82-game season plus the playoffs to play, so they didn't want to get hurt. So, you know, we saw some dunks in the first half from Michael and Scotty and Horace, and uh, in the second half, we saw the bench play. We saw B.J. Armstrong and Stacey King and those guys play, and it was it was a fun time. It was a, it was a good night, and that turned out to be because I tried to look it up before I shot this video, that turned out to be on, um, the game must have been on October 26th, 1989, because this article is dated October 27th, 1989. Uh, it was hard to find an article on this because it's, it's from the preseason, and this is in the, the Desert News. Um, this was before the internet so there was no Buffalo News website to post this but the Desert News uh, posted it and the article is entitled Jordan helps Bulls withstand the heat uh, Chicago 7-0 and in preseason action it's very short so I'm just gonna read a couple of lines here Michael Jordan scored a game high 19 points as the Chicago Bulls took an early lead and then held on to beat the Miami Heat 115-107 in uh, NBA exhibition action in Buffalo, New York. The Bulls were 11 to 15 from the floor Thursday in the game's uh, first eight minutes and built a 22-8 lead over the Heat, who shot 29% during uh, that time. With the Bulls starters long on the bench, Miami rallied from a 23-point deficit at the start of the fourth quarter. Billy Thompson, Pat Cummings, and Scott Hafner, uh, that might be Scott Hastings, um, uh, helped the Heat close the gap to 105.97 with three minutes left. But B.J. Armstrong finished with eight of Chicago's last 14 points to save the win. Hafner and Kevin Edwards led the Heat with 16 points each while Grant Long had 14, John Paxson had 17 points for the Bulls. The Bulls are 7-0 in preseason, while Miami fell to 2-3. So that was the game. That was my only time seeing Michael play. It was a magical time. And, um, you know, none of us really knew at that time that two three-peats were coming and that Michael would retire and play baseball and there would be Space Jam and the, and the Dream Team and all these different things that happened and uh, that was just a magical time and I just wanted to shoot this video to uh, reminisce on that as ESPN is rolling out uh, this series The Last Dance chronicling Michael and the Bulls final 1997-98 championship season. If you have any Michael Jordan and Chicago Bulls memories Please share those in the comments section below. Please like this video. Please share it. 
and please subscribe to my channel and always remember that your attitude determines your altitude. Take care and I'll talk to you the next time. Bye-bye.